saying hi, I'm Maurice Crespi, uh, Schindler's Attorneys. Um, we are a co-founder of um, uh, Cobra. Cobra is a pro bono initiative uh, designed to assist uh, companies in distress from a legal perspective, from a strategic perspective, from an economic perspective. Um, and we have these webinars, we have daily webinars. Today's webinar will be focusing uh, specifically on the construction industry, uh, issues that they um, are faced with. We have a panel of experts, um, legal experts, um, experts uh, in the consulting industry, and um, uh, we're going to deal with real life examples of rescues and how they've been dealt with. Um, so there's quite a lineup for today. Um, the panelists, I'll take you through them. We've got uh, Roger Hitchcock. Um, Roger is the senior partner at the Sudar Group. The Sudar Group, uh, they are a, a consulting firm that they guide boards of directors. Um, they also provide programs to educate boards uh, with toolkits that they've developed. So, you know, that gives you an idea of the Cobra Partners and the level of the Cobra Partners that are there to, uh, to assist. Uh, we Thank have... To be here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Roger. We have uh, Dean Wright. He's my partner at Schindler's Attorneys. He deals with construction matters and business rescue. Uh, he's very, very involved in Cobra, and uh, he'll be taking us through briefly the various re uh, relief funds. We've got Gary Barachovitz, he's also at Schindler's. We've got Dominique Lloyd, also at Schindler's. We have Artisha, who's the IQ business group, um, uh, as is Derek from the IQ business group. Um, sorry, I just wanna, I wanna go back because other participants I haven't mentioned. There's Sefiso, who will be, he's an uh, economist from the IQ business group and uh, he'll be taking us through his thoughts um, with specific reference to, to where the construction industry finds themselves. Um, you know, just to, to, sorry, it's Peter Gordon and Ian Fleming, they're both from Engaged, um, an Engaged Business Turnaround. They are also a co-founder of, um, of Cobra. And then finally, we have Don Mahon, advocate Don Mahon, um, he's an advocate of the Johannesburg Bar. He's acted for uh, certain, uh, quite a number of prominent commercial matters. Um, he's been involved in litigation involving Rand Gold, uh, construction uh, companies, mining houses. Um, he's acted uh, in matters dealing with business rescue. In fact, the classic case, the leading case on business rescue, Supreme Court of Appeal case, Oak Dean, the very first case, that Schindler's handled, uh, uh, Don was involved in. Um, he's uh, formed the Mahon Foundation and he's also the founder of SACommercialLaw.com, um, which uh, deals with issues such as business rescue and the legalities and new cases that uh, would be topical. So, yeah, just dealing with the construction industry, I did a you know, bit of digging and you know, I, I, I see now that um, you know, there's a report, the wholesale and retail trade and construction materials in South Africa. It's a 2020 report. It can be found on uh, researchandmarkets.com that just in relation to construction and materials, so just the trade of construction materials, you're looking at 45,000 employees and 173 companies um, including retail such as Etel Tile, Cash Build, uh, wholesalers such as P PPC, AfriSam, Max Steel, AfriMat, and Corabric. There are also other companies that uh, uh, include uh, hardware suppliers such as Bryce and Cape Engineering Suppliers. So it's a, a quite a deep analysis that the, the industry, that industry alone, is a 200 uh, billion rand industry. Uh, that was the figure for 2019. Um, the construction sector has now formed the um, emergency COVID-19 task team, rapid response task team. And what the, the industry was doing or what the task team is doing is they're looking at the recovery of the industry post-lockdown. So they're exploring that and they are 
working with the National Union of Mine Workers, and uh, they have approached the uh, Patricia Dillville, the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure, and they um, are uh, nat naturally lobbying gov government and working with the government uh, to find solutions post the, the lockdown. Uh, we have daily um, webinars that deal with law and business rescue and how it works. Um, I, I want to not necessarily go into the law, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Peter just to take us through examples that he's aware of in the construction industry of, of rescues or companies in distress. And Peter, if you can take us through just uh, you know, what occurred, but maybe with re re reference to the act where relevant, you know, so for instance, the post-commencement finance comes up and was relevant, then just take us through uh, the, the legalities around that. Peter? Uh, Maurice, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome on this sunny Johannesburg day. Hopefully it's sunny wherever you are. Um, the construction industry generally is a very difficult industry. Well, first of all, let's be clear, it's a very difficult industry to, to operate in um, for numerous reasons. Um, but specifically within the business rescue environment, difficult company to, to rescue on numerous levels. Um, if you think of your classic standard, we all in South Africa will flee to the standard construction contracts. That's FIDIC. NEC, JBC, CC, and the GCC contracts. Standard documentation makes it very easy to complete, but just be careful of the, of the contracting environment. NEC contract environment, thankfully, makes it a lot more flexible and gives a lot more opportunity to shift the risk. And that's one of the biggest tricks in construction, is how do you shift the risk? Now, because of those risks in construction, um, it's an industry that is, is um, uh, peppered with, with guarantees um, and support. So we all know you enter into a construction contract, you call to place down performance guarantees. You wish to receive a deposit, you ask to give a, a repayment guarantee, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's also the default clauses that are classic in construction contracts, the variation clauses. So all of those things together make it a well because it's these contracts are um, is the standard and and accepted as the norm of using in, in construction so you don't have to revisit the legal contract each time but the important thing in or out of rescue is how to shift the risk um, from yourselves and if you can't shift the risk as a construction company then how do you mitigate those risks so if you think of a classic construction business and then putting it in rescue you know, a construction company in rescue, if it's a large um, group, we've got group five in rescue at the moment, in order to rescue a thing of that nature, what, you, what the practitioners are more than likely to do is look to selling off um, parts of the business or divisions of the business. Anybody that's involved in the industry knows that one of the biggest challenges is to keep that monster moving. If you've got heavy goods, yellow goods, um, equipment plus people, um, unfortunately, the construction industry knows that people you have to lay off fairly rapidly if your projects are diminishing. And it's, it's, because it's project driven, you have a situation where government holds back um, because they are the, always the biggest employer on infrastructure projects. If they're holding back through whatever reason, and we've had that in South Africa for some time now, construction companies suffer immediately, the larger ones, because they don't have the ability to, to clamp down immediately with the investment in, in plant and machinery. So as I say, from a, from a rescue point of view, important that the practitioner understands the contractual environment in which the, the construction company is operating, the obligations to, to uh, customers, clients, as well as subcontractors, both uh, against and for. Um, normally, a con something like Group 5 goes into rescue a plethora of smaller businesses have just been affected. Um, Ian and I are dealing with one at the moment, which is, is about to go into rescue, um, because the, the knock-on effect of a construction company is, is going into rescue is huge. The, the, Maurice, the normal rules apply. Um, the, is the moratorium on, on any legal claims? Um, construction tends to be a litigious environment, so to have the, the moratorium does help. 
Um, and then you've got to find, you know, where you can sell to. Um, Group 5 have sold off a couple of their divisions. Their buyers have been other large or medium-sized construction businesses. Um, Group 5 thankfully had a lot of business out of South Africa, which prior to COVID was an attraction. Of course, with the, the COVID malaise, the entire globe is affected. So all African com- countries are um, affected. I'm involved in a on construction business. We're building a, a, a plant up in, in Ghana at the moment, and it's continuing. Um, thankfully, the Chinese came back on flow, so they're supplying us product. Um, and we've got contractors on the ground. They are classed as essential services, and we're busy building a factory. So construction can continue. But it, as I said, Maurice and I, I'll take questions, but it, it is a difficult industry to, to rescue. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, please, audience, uh, ask questions. Uh, that's why we have a webinar, so that we can engage. Um, so feel free, you can also ask questions anonymously if you, if you want to. Um, you, you, you may mention, Peter, the, the knock-on effect to, to the smaller industries. I'd ask Safiso, the economist, um, from IQ Business, just to give us his thoughts and his thinking uh, around uh, the present situation and the economic recovery. So, Fisa? Thanks, Morris. Um, you know, so one of the thinking, I guess, around the sector was, you know, who are, who are the winners going to be and who are the losers going to be in the context of the sector and maybe what are some of the interesting opportunities um, that might come out of the sector. Um, you know, and so I think it's, it, it's quite obvious that uh, commercial um, uh, property is, is certainly taking a hit already. Uh, but, you know, the, the estimation is that the impact uh, won't, um, will probably be on the top end be about as 30% of, uh, of businesses will adopt this work uh, from home type of approach. And, and, and therefore the revenue is at risk um, through an augmented rental model, I guess, on uh, the back of, of, of commercial uh, property, uh, I guess is about 30% revenue at risk on the top end. Um, and that's just also, it's, it's based on a number of things. The first thing is that uh, there are a lot of businesses that um, still need uh, kind of, you know, uh, security around uh, their workplaces and so, the WeWork type of shared space model um, is still not um, as attractive as one might think it would be. Uh, you also, you know, the, the WeWork models also tend to be, it's a, I think they call them the, the laptop kings or the, the laptop warriors, that's the word. And it's, it's usually a lot of the guys who are software developers who, who are able to have relatively more flexible work environments um, creatives, etc., who've tended to be the larger component um, adopters of the shared space um, working model versus other versus other kinds of institutions, and so uh, I guess that's probably a lot of the thinking that gets modelled into this number that maximum about thirty percent will be at risk from a revenue point of view from commercial property. Um, the interesting thing around that is that. Uh, you know, when you when you move on to the retail property portfolio, that's going to be uh, very very interesting. Primarily because malls have usually, I guess, uh, modeled their revenue around you know um, foot traffic, and with social distancing, uh, you know, becoming more one commonplace and absent a vaccine, we're probably going to see a lot more. Um, kind of energy targeted towards uh, social distancing in general. And that means that uh, the retail pro- uh, property portfolios are probably going to be at risk for, you know, um, for a good portion of the next 18 to 24 months. Um, and, and where you might find not so much a, a problem from a, a rental point of view with the retail properties, probably in the rural and peri-urban areas, is primarily because they don't have the... I guess one the luxury of uh, of online shopping um, in terms of access to data and uh, and 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 also a cultural thing is that that, that it's not a practice that's um, I think incul- inculcated itself into those portions of, of the population and so um, you know 
is it resilient um, that had a lot of these um, decentralized um, smaller shopping centers they might um, have a bit of a you know a better experience from a retail shopping point of view than some of the other you know uh, bigger uh, property portfolios the uh, likes of growth point etc um, we also I think expecting some some interesting development in the social infrastructure space. Uh, so the likes of M3 Cargo, um, they have done a lot of the work in in terms of gap housing, etc. But uh, we we even the tone that we're seeing from a national leadership point of view is certainly moving towards social benefit type of a tone um, in terms of economic thinking from a government point of view. And so we're going to see a lot more um, in this particular context going towards social infrastructure. And so that, that means uh, we already know that the, the plans now for additional hospitals to be built um, uh, and, and other primary care facilities. And over and above that, uh, there's housing that continues to be an issue. We saw in the previous budget that they had cut the allocation, fun, funny enough, to housing by about 11 billion or so. Um, in the budget and they, and they caught a lot of flack on the back of that and I think uh, there's, there's going to be some rethinking of, of, of that social portfolio from an infrastructure point of view. Um, and and, and uh, a lot of also the additional infrastructure that's probably going to come out is a rollout of, uh, you know, probably these mobile structures because we are constrained fiscally. But what happens is that you initially roll out a mobile structure, um, you know, it's uh, um, prefurb, and then over time, then you start to put harder structures on the back of that, and so concrete and, 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 and more established structures. And so there's probably a lot more of these uh, quick um, projects that are going to come through, which are designed or geared towards a mobile type of structure. Um, interestingly enough, I think uh, student accommodation is, is, is going to continue being um, a theme in the property space. Uh, there's a currently a shortage of about 430,000 beds uh, in the economy. Um, about 200 or 250,000 of those are attributable to um, FET colleges. So we're not thinking the likes of UCT, the WITS, etc. Those also tend to, um, you know, kind of uh, soft commission or commission their, their, their property or the student accommodation um, kind of projects by themselves. Um, so it's a lot of NSFAS backed um, and government backed um, type of student accommodation projects. Uh, and so we're gonna see a lot of, of that continuing um, primarily just because the, there's just no capacity and the conditions in which the, the, the kids um, studying in these institutions are, are really terrible. And so I think it's, it's social risk for government not to deal with the issue of student accommodation. And so that's going to continue being an interesting one. Um, and, uh, you know, I think over and above that, there's uh, warehousing. Uh, it's an interesting one, primarily because of what's going to happen with um, e-commerce e in the South African context. Historically, before pre-COVID environment, e-commerce in South Africa hadn't caught uh, as much fire as they had hoped it would. Uh, you know, I think of all online transactions, it, it, it was accountable, um, it accounted for about seven, between seven and, and 11% on any given year, um, depending on which uh, metrics we were looking at. But what's happening now is that we're already seeing a lot of the retailers gearing up for a lot more retail, um, uh, online shopping uh, from a retailing point of view. We're also going to see that, we're probably going to see a lot more of that um, coming out of the clothing and textiles retailers as well. Um, and, and therefore, warehousing is really going to be an interesting play in terms of the, uh, the property portfolio as well as uh, construction opportunities. And I mean, if you just drive on the, on the R21 to Pretoria, you'll see that massive factory with uh, DSV there. Uh, you know, historically, particularly the retailers, uh, spas and them had, had uh, looked at a decentralized um, warehousing model. Uh, take a lot, I think, in some research they did in the UK, found that they lose most of their money, actually, not because uh, of, of, the, of a centralized warehousing model, but rather in the last kilometer of finding the customer. And, and they've started incorporating that in the South African context, and that's why they've got uh, delivery hubs. 
where in you know in garages now there are pickup points for a macro DSV take a lot etc. And it's because they're not the additional effort it takes to go into the suburb or into wherever they're delivering is where they actually lose revenue. And and so a lot of these now decentralized hubs rather um, are the opportunities in which they're exploring to be able to to maximize uh, the revenue from a central distribution point of view. And so I think we're going to see a lot of these mega warehouses coming coming up on board, on board with the likes of the Mr. Prices, et cetera. That's probably an interesting play that's coming up um, on the back of a rise in online shopping and e-commerce. And, and, you know, and uh, the argument is also that they're not trying to target, from an e-commerce point of view, not trying to target the whole population, but you're trying to target, uh, you know, the, the portion of the population that, you know, probably was, you know, is, is partially digitally active through, you know, uh, and, and has some credit card and, 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 and they've got a relative sense of comfort around how they transact. And, 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 and that's probably a target of about five to seven million customers in the economy. Um, but that warrants an investment, a sizable investment in these mega warehouses. And so outside of that, there's probably going to be something really, really interesting happening in the residential property portfolio. Um, primarily because on the one side, when you're seeing, uh, you know, 200 basis point uh, decline in, in interest rates, uh, there's risk to the rental market at a mid-level where a lot of the people who are probably renting for about 9,000, 10,000 a month could probably now transfer that into an ownership type of a, of a structure. And so there might be some switching out of the rental market into that, but also because of the pre pressure that you're gonna find on households from an earnings point of view. I think the property portfolio, rent, rental property portfolio, somewhere between four and a half thousand and seven thousand is gonna become relatively more interesting. So we're probably gonna see a lot more flooding um, into rental, into that space, um, given the, the earnings income pressure that we're going to find. Um, a lot of the high-end houses are, are, um, are certainly going to sell at a discount. The discount is probably estimated between 25 and 35 percent. And so you're looking at houses north of about 1.6, 1.7 million rand and upwards. And so there's probably going to be big discounts coming on, on on those houses for anyone trying to sell. So it's probably not a good selling time in the res residential space if you are on that, on, in that basket of, of, of property. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and what's also gonna be quite interesting is how the banks respond to their, their concentration, portfolio concentration, um, you know, primarily because, you know, they've got the likes of Bowens, for example, who bank with them, um, and who are geared uh, up to their neck. And so they want to either ensure that there's rental uh, happening in the portfolios or the sale. And so you'll probably find that a lot of the home loan um, type of agreements for apartments is probably going to be a lot more concessionary than it's been to ensure that they protect their book um, given the large um, exposure they have to some of these developers that are in the market. And so I think that's going to be quite interesting, um, you know, in the in the property space and and in terms of the various portfolios that 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 we that we observe in in the context of that industry, and that's of course got material implications for construction as well. And so I think that's uh, you know a high level view from from our point in terms of what what may the COVID impact be uh, in property and construction. Have you have you come across mass mass re, uh, historic mass repurpose, uh, repurposing of buildings? I mean, uh, in, has it ever occurred uh, occurred before? Because is that what what economists foresee? Um, you know, what 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 do economists say about the likes of Samson City? Will well, it be that's... repurposed? Will they will they will, will it be mothballed? What do you think will happen? So it, I think it'll it, it'll move towards a mixed use, and so they'll probably try to adopt more, try to transform um, more portions of it into uh, residential um, and and commercial, and and that way they'll de-risk themselves. 
certainly won't be mothballed. Uh, I think there's already um, a, lot, a lot of capital that's gone into that, and and and, and they won't. I mean, they would, they'd sell it for a song if they actually did. Um, and so it's probably going to be a repurposing um, towards more mixed use. Um, and and yeah, I think that's probably gonna, the, the, the kind of, a, of a approach we'd find. I think also some of the guys with, um, who are sitting on large cash balances now uh, might take advantage of, 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 of this opportunity of, in terms of buying some of those properties because of the low interest rate environment. So some of the big developers, there the, the could be interesting um, property switches uh, and portfolio transactions that are gonna take place um, you know, depending on who's got more, who's got more muscle um, in this current context, and so it'll be quite interesting to see what happens there. But I, I, I expect that there's going to be some transactions, um, uh, you know, from you know who's got money and who doesn't, as well as a, a reconfiguration into probably more mixed use um, versus strictly retail. Uh, before I move on to Roger, I just have a, a final question for you, and it, re it relates to the stimulus packages. Um, in 2009, in America, they put together an economic stimulus plan in the construction industry, um, and the uh, you know the, what 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 was that? There was a 49 billion investment in transportation. Um, energy projects, uh, federal buildings, and it was really a, a, a package designed uh, to stimulate construction, that particular industry, um, with reference to public works, uh, primarily in relation to public works, and they, they passed the Recovery Act, and they distributed the funds, um, uh, job creation engine for the construction was roughly two thirds of the appropriate designated for infrastructure repair, renovation, and maintenance of buildings, public buildings. Uh, so, if you, so there's there, 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 there's been talk and there, there, there was mention of the stimulus package in relation to uh, uh, public works in South Africa. What do you foresee there? I mean, are we going to be having high speed rail lines between Johannesburg and Durban? How will that work? Um, so the the first focus is on bulk infrastructure, and so it's in essence repair and maintenance of uh, of sewage, drainage, um, uh, power plants, etc. It's, it's uh, water. So it's, in the the starting point is certainly around how do we fast track and how do we better enable service delivery, and so the kind of infrastructure will be geared towards service service delivery model. And, and that also then lends itself to roads and bridges. So I'd say the prioritization from a government point of view is certainly gonna be bulk, it will be roads and bridges. And then over and above that, uh, we'll, we'll see more of the, of the focus going towards the mega infrastructure um, projects that have already been announced um, in the various nodes in the economy. So I think those are the three um, construction thrusts I, I, I can imagine um, you know, being detailed in the in the package itself, and it's uh, and and as I said, I think the acceleration will certainly be more towards social infrastructure, more than what we'd call economic infrastructure, uh, and and that's also just by virtue of, of of the multiplier effect that you get from the social infrastructure investment first before you you prioritize economic infrastructure. Final final question: Where do you see the industry? The end of 2021 compared to January 2019. It's a completely different context. Um, uh, I think uh, you know what happened post 2009 is that we also had the um, the World Cup frenzy. Uh, 19, um, 19. Sorry, sorry, 19. So what I was saying is uh, the the construction industry was ailing already in January oh, 2019, yeah, yeah. so it was suffering. Where will it be? Because presumably there'll be a surge in construction if these stimulus packages come in. So if, if, compare the health. I'd ask you to comment on the health of the construction industry in January okay. 2019 and where you see a, com a comparison to, let's say, December 2021. 
I mean, yeah, you're right. So we've seen about seven consecutive quarters of negative growth in the construction sector. Um, sector. I think um, over the last 13 months or so, they've lost in excess of about 220,000 jobs. Um, so it's certainly been a sector in a lot of pain. Um, one, I think what's, what's, what's certainly going to, going to happen is that uh, we're going to see a lot more um, of the smaller players uh, coming back on board. Uh, you know, to and I guess that's um, towards a transformation thrust. Um, and and as I said, and and, and that's largely going to be public works driven projects. Um, so as I said, we know that the hospitals are already on the go. Um, bids are out, etc., for people to bid um, bid in private care facilities to build those. And and uh, and it's going to be a fast tracking of of social infrastructure, and it's mostly going to be the smaller players. Um, I think. The, the larger players are probably going to have to rationalize their portfolios um, and, and the kind of projects that they get into. And they're probably going to need to get smarter in terms of how they participate in the mega and the larger um, construction projects. So uh, I, I think it, it's probably we're moving towards, a, I'd say, a, a more competitive um, construction space. Uh, we understand, you know, we, you know, if you look at the Marie and Roberts, for example, so it's not all the projects that run them to the ground. It's one, two, one or two projects that they only priced on about 1% profit on those projects. And so, it, 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 it's, um, so there's going to be an emphasis and a focus now on, on pricing in the construction space. And that will probably also have some inflationary implications on the cost of projects uh, where they're now going to target probably um, profitability levels of about 5 and 10% um, depending on the project size. And so I think we're certainly going to see a healthier construction sector in 2021, but um, the, the extent to which, you know, the ramp up is not going to be aggressive. I think it's going to be a gradual one. Great. Thanks for that. Thanks, Safisa. That was Thanks, fantastic Anna. insight there. Um, I'd like to move over to Roger. So we've heard now post-COVID, uh, mm -hmm. the economics uh, of where we are now and where we're going. Uh, let's focus at a board level, if, if we will, uh, Roger. Uh, what do you see, uh, uh, apropos governance and boards, the new normal post this crisis? Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks, Safisa and Peter. I think that's laid a, a fantastic foundation. I've been writing furious notes because I think, I think what we're seeing is we are seeing some, some wholesale changes, um, which, which we all... all um, we've recognized, but to start getting some, some detail around what those look like is going to be critical. And so if, if we kind of, as you said, Maurice, get into the, into the boardroom, um, and I suppose the best way to think about it is to say, what conversations should we be having in the boardroom right now? Um, and when I talk about in the boardroom, it's essentially the governance of, of, of businesses. So uh, the principle is that governance has to precede management, um, because Governance is where the decision making starts and I think some of the conversations there's obviously right now and it would have started already but the risk management conversation which how do we fix the immediate um, and I think there's been a lot of focus on that and, and, and it's been what can we do in the short term, what can we fix. I think what's happening is we are starting to turn a corner um, tomorrow here in South Africa, we have we have a done status, and we'll see what the implications are of, of, of that. I know construction is kind of pushing to get earlier in, in the line than they have been in some of the earlier, you know, the, the, the first models. Um, but it's really a case of saying, what does the timeline look like um, going, going forward? And how is one going to manage the, the critical risks? And so looking at some of the some of the changes, and I think one of the challenges in the business, in the in the construction industry is that the construction industry's business model is highly dependent on other business models. And that came out in what Safiso was saying. You know, the people are going to be using buildings, using construction, using infrastructure in a completely different way in some cases, and how that is going to be utilized from the discussion around repurposing malls, warehousing, the shift in things. Thinking. And so one of the other critical conversations I really believe that is going to be necessary in the boardroom is to relook at who you are linked to on both the purchase side and the sales side of your business. So, so looking at who are you building for, what industries are you building for, and how are they going to change? And the challenge with construction is it's, a, it's, it's in a sense a slow lag, it's a slow lag industry. Um, the nature of decisions in other people's boardrooms is going to depend on when you can get going. 
and the nature of the projects that you're going to get um, get get involved in. And and that's going to be quite quite important to to think of. And so in in kind of governance terminology, that's called your your stakeholder engagement processes and mapping processes. Really re-looking at the relationships within which your business operates, because every business is part of a broader ecosystem. And it really, it really boils down to identifying which decisions are, are, is your business dependent on that sit outside of your business. So as, as Safisa said, there's obviously gonna be a move into some infrastructure. There's gonna be you know, hospitals. And again, this depends on whether this virus has a second or third or whatever wave. And some of those decisions are going to be, be long-term decisions, fundamental changes, some of them are going to be short-term reactions, which may not turn out to be to be true. I'm, in the back of my mind, I think we we could probably have a glut of masks in the market in six months' time because everybody who can has shifted to making masks, and I know that that's a it's a critical shortage now. But the challenge in supply chains is when you get a disruption in a supply chain, it tends to extra, exacerbate through the supply chain. And so it's recognizing, as I said, who, who are you dependent on? Who is your business dependent on? And who are you on both sides of the, of the, the equation? Um, and so it's the, and that feeds back into your risk thinking because it's remapping your risks based on, based on that. Um, and then the third conversation. So I think the, the critical third one that is starting to emerge more and more is the strategic conversation based on how the environment, how we anticipate the environment is going to change based on how we anticipate relationships are going to change. We need to start re-looking at our, at our um, fundamental business models and, and what we have in the present, what capabilities we have. And it may be looking deeper than just your functions and your services in your business and what you, what you can do to what you know and how do you restructure that to do a different thing. Um, especially as we anticipate. And so looking ahead into the future is going to be absolutely critical. If we are not having scenario-based conversations and, and, having, and thinking out the box, because this is something the world has never been through, um, we won't know what to look out for in the environment. And so in the environment, as we see it unfold, strategically, it's important to think about what are the signposts that are starting to emerge? Um, and, and some of those, Safisa, thank you for that information. I've got a, a lot of notes myself, as I said, and um, I'm going to recommend that, that this, is a, this is just simply that overview of, of the economy in the space is something that a lot of people listen to because it gives some insight into the information we need to be, be, be looking at in our, in our boardrooms. And so the strategic conversation, what, what do we think our businesses will look like in six months, in a year's time? As you said, Maurice, you know, the 2021 picture, I would go even so far as to say, I think some of the changes are, are not, I think 2021 is, is still short term. And we need to be starting to anticipate what our businesses need to look like in the next three or four or five years. And it's not as if the business, as we said, as you finished, Maurice and, and, and Safiso, it's not as if the sector wasn't in trouble. And I think part of the challenge was that the old business model in construction was already starting to um, get threatened. I, I was going to say fall apart, but I, you know that happened in some cases. And so we are seeing and have seen the shift down to the more nimble, more agile um, business models that are able to rethink how they manage projects, how they manage costs, how they coordinate better as a supply chain, and how they change the culture of the, the construction industry. Um, so those are some of the things that, that I think, so the risk conversation, absolutely critical to keep going as we see things change. The stakeholder conversation, who are we dependent on, related to, who do we collaborate with, who makes the decision that our decisions are dependent on, and then the strategic conversation, let's look forward and test out, you know, what assumptions are we making that we can put out there, what models would work best for our business based on the skill sets that we, that we have. Um, but you, Maurice, any, any thoughts or questions around that? Maurice, could um, I just add to what Roger's just said there? Because there's a, a couple of uh, nubs there that uh, we come across. When you're in rescue, you're in crisis <clears throat> management. <clears throat> and one's got to get your mind through that. Because you, if <clears throat> you're managing in crisis mode, you're constantly looking backwards for where the fires are. And that's yeah. not the way to rescue a company. So that's strategic discussion. And what we found, and we've had comments from banks, shareholders and directors 
a relief that somebody from outside is coming and taking a look at the business and thinking strategically. Because when you're trying to keep your staff play, paid, unfortunately, the reality of the situation, boards spend a lot of time trying to find where they can get the cash to pay the staff, yeah. as opposed to what they're going to be doing next week. So those lead indicators become critical. And then 100% what Roger said, I mean, the business that I'm involved in is, is EPCM type business. We shift, I spend, my main role in the business is to shift the risk elsewhere mm. and to spread it. So we will use numerous subcontractors. We will use numerous suppliers so that we're not exposed to any one particular project, any one particular industry and manage that risk far more. And as Roger rightly said, I think the days of, and we talk jokingly in this country about the Bucky Brigade, but the days of those guys, and they're still going to be there um, because we small business is still quite critical, but how to support those guys and how to use them. Maurice, I'll, I'll just mention in Cobra, we, we're talking to a, a fairly large construction company where they're doing exactly that. They're using our services to, to assist their subbies to how to manage this crisis. But hopefully this attitude goes beyond. And I'm also not a great one for thinking that, you know, boards get bogged down in in governance. I've sat on enough boards where you spend all your time looking backwards, approving notices, approving financials, approving budgets, etc. Rather than how the hell, are we, where do we want to get to? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. is it still valid? And how do we get there? And if we're not all walking down the same road, with the variance and the flexibility that somebody can wander off the road for a while. Mm -hmm. But if we don't identify what that end goal is, then, you know, as Lewis Carroll said, if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter what road you take when he was speaking to Alice. But, you know, yeah. I think there's some yeah. really important things there, the, a mind shift that is required from senior management and directors. Yeah, yeah, one comment there. Thanks, Peter, for that, because I think that's exactly it. The, the most important thing or skill to develop is the skill of foresight in this, in this time. We cannot run our businesses on hindsight. And one of the most powerful metaphors in this governance space is the fact that the word governance comes from a Greek word, Kubernetes that means the captain of the ship and right now all of our businesses are you know and as someone said we're we're not all in the same ship but we're all going through the same storm and everything around us has changed the destination still needs to be kept in mind as critical that's the longer term but we need to be looking at not just maybe our 2025 2030 vision but our 2021 end of 2020 vision um, and, and then unpacking that in terms of what does that mean in terms of the assumptions the actions everything in between. Foresight is going to get us through this, not hindsight. And it's critical. Maurice? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a question. Um, you know, we've been, we, we're talking governance. Roger, what, what are your views in relation to governance around uh, issues such as social responsibility, mm -hmm. around uh, environmental responsibility? Um, you know, I'd imagine that there's going to be an, an increased focus on social responsibility, particularly when it comes to, to, to health. But I'm just thinking, you know, we've, we've, we've reduced carbon emissions by 10%. Will there be a, a, a trend, uh, a, a governance trend on boards to actually say, look, you know, do things differently. Uh, if yeah. you're going to be building in the construction industry, is there going to be that additional responsibility? Will you yeah. guys develop toolkits? Uh, how will you be advising boards? What do you, what do you think will be happening yeah. in that space? Yeah. So I think what we're going to see happen, and we're, we're seeing it, is this event has been a catalytic event. It's, it's accelerated, I think, lots of the pressure on businesses to th rethink the way they do business. And one of the, one of the building pressures has obviously been um, the environmental and the social, the social issue. You know, the two big themes running 2018, 2019, and into the early part of, 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 of this year have been inequality and climate change. And those have been putting pressure on boards who have, who, who are now finding themselves answerable for suddenly a whole lot of other things as we go through a crisis. And I think the emergence of it, it's a real opportunity for boards. And even, so this is where the, the, the shareholder relationship between the board is going to be critical. I know lots of, lots of companies have had to sit down with their shareholders, whether they're private companies or larger companies or, you know, held by trusts or whatever they are and say, this thing has changed everything. What we were anticipating for this year and the next year and the next year is going to change completely. No dividends or, you know, we need to change the, that relationship. And it's a, 
it's a very good opportunity to re-engage at a values level with, with, with shareholders, as well as a values level with people in the, in the business. We also know the pressure has been that the millennial generation that has come through the Z generation is they look at the world in a different way. They buy in a different way. Um, and I know this isn't directly related to construction, but in construction, we're going to have those people making decisions into the future about the kind of, the kind of buildings they want to occupy, the houses they want to live in. Um, and, and, and it really is. So it's, it's a deep rethink. Um, you know, it's like when you re have to reset your, your computer or your phone, and it, it takes a little while to get going. But it's, we're in that little while. We're in that spinning circle or, or whatever it is on your, on your device. And we've got to use the opportunity to think about really what the impact of our decisions are going to be going, going forward. And especially in South Africa where the big issue of inequality is, is one that if we don't address, and it's going to be, it's going to be made worse by this, it, certainly in the short term. But can we rethink about our businesses so that, and, and this hasn't been thought through before. I often say to people I work with that everything we have in the governance space, in the strategy space, someone thought of somewhere before. And we're using models that have, have started off in people's minds. And so we've got to start off and say, how do we rethink the entire world almost? And I know that's a bit crazy, but how do we rethink, even from the legal perspective, you guys who are working with the laws that give us the guidance, how do you engage and rethink through how the legal framework enables things to work going forward? Thank yeah. you. Uh, thanks for that, Roger. Just on, on the legal framework, I think it's important to mention um, that uh, when it comes to companies in financial distress, there is an obligation on the board to put mm -hmm. business rescue to the vote in terms of our Companies Act. And yeah. um, the vote, the, the, if the vote is against putting the company into business rescue, so the starting point is, is the company in financial distress? Will the company be able to uh, meet its obligations or is there a likelihood it won't within the uh, ensuing six months? The moment you have that trigger, the board has to put it to the vote. Yeah. And if the board votes against it, the board has to send a notice to employees and shareholders uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, and creditors detailing uh, the reasons as to why the board voted against. And that's why we, we, we formed COBRA, because COBRA mm -hmm. is that very reason. If you, if you put it to the vote and you say, we've entered the COBRA ecosystem, therefore they're going to rescue the company outside of business rescue. That's what COBRA is about. Yeah. COBRA is not about business rescue. COBRA is about using business rescue as a tool if mm -hmm. it's required but only if yeah. it's required and we're finding that it's, uh, it, it's, it's not as required as normal. If companies in distress now, uh, creditors are far, far more accommodating. The last yeah. one, uh, uh, I think we'll move more to the legal experts. We have Don Mahan and we have, we have Dean. As only, I'm gonna to move to Don and just ask Don, you know, around uh, construction contracts and, and Biz Mayor um, and, and the legal situation there, I've got no doubt that there's been quite a, quite a bit of discussion and quite a views have been formulated. Can you comment on that? Have, they, have, have you seen any activity in that space? Yes, very much so, Maurice. Um, uh, particularly over the last uh, month, um, what with the lockdown being what it is. I, I mean, we know that uh, the construction industry, as Safiso said, is, has been in some decline in our country for a while. Uh, and we know that as an industry, it's, it, it's really, it's built on cash flow. So um, we're already seeing huge disruption in logistics and general supply chain, uh, not just because of work stoppages, but we'll see greater uh, disruptions because of the economic impact that this is having on contractors and subcontractors. So um, we, we have seen um, uh, the, uh, an industry which is already in some decline, really feeling some distress as a result of what's been happening. And we will see a greater use of existing mechanisms which are built into construction contracts to manage that cash flow, the use of performance guarantees and payments guarantees and the like. Um, we had already started seeing an increase in, in the use of business rescue as a mechanism to manage cash flow in the industry. Uh, and another mechanism which will, I believe, be used a lot and, and which people should look at is um, a mechanism uh, through the election of adjudication as a means of resolving disputes because it's intended to be less expensive and, and 
to allow contractors to obtain access to cash flow through the quick and speedy resolution of disputes. But what, what is critical for people in the industry to observe is that um, even business rescue, whilst uh, an effective mechanism to insulate you from the problems in performing your obligations under the construction contracts, it doesn't protect you from a situation where the, the employer is going to call up a performance guarantee, for example, because of the, the separate nature of the contract between the guarantor and the, and the employer. So it's, it's really vital for people in the industry to look at normal commercial mechanisms of spreading and managing their risk. Uh, you, look, you need to look at all commercial options available before it gets to a point where you're gonna start defaulting on your contractual obligations and employers or main contractors are gonna start looking at um, guarantees as a means to insulate themselves from, from your risk of default. So there are all, already these um, inbuilt contractual mechanisms that are widely used in the industry, but uh, particularly for the smaller businesses who tend to ignore them, uh, it, it, it really is for, for, for ongoing business. It's vital for, for companies to look at these inbuilt mechanisms that diversify the risk and spread the risk around. Until Visma, your what are the what are the legal principles outside of the outside of the agreement? What's the common law position? Well, Visma, your typically is a situation where through um, through events which were not foreseeable by either party and are not the fault of either party, a party can be excused from performing uh, his or her obligations under a contract. So, so a typical example is um, if there's now a law that prohibits construction workers from attending at site, uh, it can hardly be expected of a contractor to continue with the building operations. Um, before notions of lockdowns and COVID-19, the, the typical example of a Visma Your event would be where a builder is supposed to build a uh, do renovations on a house, but uh, overnight an earthquake happens and uh, the house crumbles and falls into the ground. There's now no more house that you can uh, conduct renovations on. In those circumstances, the contractor would be excused from the performance of his obligations. But what we're seeing though is, and I don't know whether it's uh, people taking a chance or whether it's a misapprehension that people are laboring under, is where, where obligations to make payment, for example, have already accrued. And employers are very often now saying, well, um, you, you are owed money, but we cannot pay you now because of a vis major or force majeure event in the form of the lockdown, which has impacted our suppliers and our ability to generate income. And so it's no longer commercially viable for us to make payment to you. Now that's simply not what vis major is. And it's not an excuse for people to rely on a decline in economic viability to make payment. Um, you would only be excused from making payment if the obligation to make payment had not yet arisen or if through some dramatic event, it was now physically impossible for you to transfer the money, which is not really a situation that we're facing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So people are being opportunistic and, and I certainly have seen a, a flurry of matters recently where um, contracting parties have attempted to uh, um, get some relief in complying with their payment obligations by relying on the situation, but, but it's, it's quite frankly misguided. And, and a lot of contractors are suffering as a result because they rely on these payments to pay their, their subcontractors. Don, what's the, what's the position? At what point can you cancel um, a contract under Visma Your, um, uh, under the common law? So if you, if you don't have, a, there aren't any express provisions, uh, at what point? I mean, you can't sit and not uh, perform, it's, uh, be in a, a state of limbo for, forever, I presume. What's, what's, what's the position there? Well, um, if the contract is silent on it, then, then typically it, it depends on the nature of the obligations which are no longer possible to be performed. If the, the, the inability to perform is interim in nature, um, such as, for example, because of the lockdown, um, 
then it would not necessarily result in the contract coming to an end. It would result more in a suspension of the obligations under the contract until such time as the impossibility of performance is no longer present. Um, but it depends on the nature of the obligation, depends on the nature of the contract. In, in contracts where we talk about time being of the essence, where it's vital to um, the nature of the contract that it had to, that it, uh, performance has to take place by a certain date. If it's now no longer possible to perform by that date, that might be a basis upon which the contract can now be brought to an end because it will never, despite the lockdown easing in due course, it will now never be possible for performance by that date to take place. But if, um, if performance by a particular date is not strictly necessary under the contract and it's the, the normal situation of where parties' performance of their obligations has to take place within a reasonable time of any antecedent obligation, then that would merely result in a suspension of the obligations and not a termination of the contract. Great, thank you very much, Don. Um, we're going to conclude just with an update from Dean. Um, if, Dean, if you can just give me a rundown, it's, it's obviously topical when it comes to staff. I mean, we've, we see the tens of thousands of staff in just the, the construction supply sector. Um, wh wh what's the latest there, Dean, on, on the relief funds? So, so yeah, thanks, Bruce. There's, there's, um, what I just urge everyone to, to look at, all the attendees, is to go to the, the cobra.org.za website. Um, if you go to the bottom there, there's a, there's a, there's a help portal, there's a knowledge portal that has, we've spent a lot of time in actually um, creating an, a, a high level snapshot of each of those funds. Um, at this stage, and I was looking yesterday, I think we've got about 37 initiatives there. And it goes, it ranges from the bank initiatives all the way to telecoms uh, initiatives. But for the purposes of today, I just want to touch on, on two quite important ones. Uh, and the, the first one is the, the temporary employee, employer employee relief benefit, which is, uh, quite, is known quite well, it's become quite famous and known as TERS. And what this is, is an initiative where employers can apply on behalf of their employees to, uh, through the UIF to um, obtain a percentage to supplement certain of their employees' um, income. And the, the section of the employees that we're talking about are those who can no longer work or can only partially work. There is a bit of confusion on who can make this application, and it's been talked about quite a lot uh, this week. We've got some guidance on it, and it, the, the important part is that you have to be registered for UIF prior to COVID. Um, I do understand, I read somewhere uh, yesterday that they are making certain concessions and uh, if you were not fully compliant with your UIF or up to date with your payments, there they were AODs being entered into between the employer and, the, and UIF so that you can bring everything up to date and then have access on behalf of your employees for it. So that's the TERS one. Um, what I actually would like to say is that at 11 o'clock, which is now, we are holding a seminar, a webinar, sorry, on, on TERS. It was it's held by Pierre van Amerva as one of our partners. So if everyone would like to link, the best way is to go to the Schindler's website. That's the quickest way. And there's a banner at the top there that everyone can register to have a look at. So that's, that's TERS in a nutshell. Um, and if you go to the COBRA website, it'll give you a lot more information. But there's also quite an interesting one that I'm uh, looking at, and it's called the uh, COVID-19 Construction Rapid Response Task Team. And what this appears to be is um, some key industry bodies have taken a view on what will be needed post-lockdown in terms of the construction industry. And it's, it's aimed at getting things in place to help everyone sort of kickstart as soon as lockdown ends. And some of the key features and issues that they're going to be dealing with are identifying opportunities where the construction and built environment can assist in the national disaster and relief efforts, um, interpretation and of regulations during lockdown and the absence of clear reference to the construction industry, um, bearing in mind that a lot of these agreements, such as JVCC and NEC and, and those ones, don't, they, 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 they do to an extent deal with vis mayor and, and um, force majeure as, you, as uh, Don was talking about, but I think there's definitely room for an expansion on that. And I think we'll see quite a lot of development on that. 
Um, the other things that they're looking at is exploring for, of relief measures uh, specific to sectors, supporting emergency procurement for the next 12 months, and discuss the interventions for the recovery of the industry. And I think that's quite important because we all know that once lockdown goes and, and is lifted and the construction industry can start operating again, it's going to be quite a slow wheel, I think, because your suppliers are going to have to, in a turn, uh, you know, chat to their suppliers and in turn, you know, this wheel is going to have to start turning again. And I think the, the measures that this task team looks like it's going to be getting involved in will help all of those, those tiers and those layers um, down the construction industry to, to begin the, to begin the, the construction um, industry uh, you know, revival, I think is the word. Great. Thanks, Dean. So that concludes today's webinar. Thanks for attending. Uh, COBRA is about assisting uh, businesses, including in construction. Um, as panelists mentioned, we are already involved uh, in, in construction businesses, large construction companies where we're dealing with the, the suppliers, the supply chain, we're assisting them, we're setting up uh, 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 specific webinars for the suppliers. Um, we have a team of mediators, we um, will gladly assist in negotiating payment arrangements. If you come into the ecosystem, we have a notice that you can send to your creditors saying why you're not uh, voting for business rescue. It's because you're in the ecosystem. And importantly, the ecosystem's also become a marketplace. Uh, we're finding that uh, members of COBRA, or participants in COBRA, are um, assisting one another. So if you're in the ecosystem, you'll also find that your services may be required by um, other, other, other members. Um, yeah, so, so that wraps today up. I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for attending. There are countless other webinars uh, on, we just mentioned that Pierre's on now, uh, dealing with the relief funds in, specifically with the relief funds, so you can join that. You can also go to the Schindler's uh, Facebook page where you'll find the webinars and further details. So thank you very much. Thanks to the panelists. Uh, until next time, goodbye.